Oh, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny Happy to be here. Okay. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, thanks so much. Hey, I made it. No, you did. There you are. But you can go ahead and uh, start us off while I catch my breath. And um, yeah, I'm cool with closing out. Hey, Dr. Webster. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for presenting today. Absolutely. Happy to. I think we're expecting at least one uh, guest um, from the group. I think we were able to get in touch with Dr. Wong. Um, so hopefully she's able to join today. And just to confirm, everyone can see like the normal PowerPoint view, not the present presenter view. Okay. Happy to have you, Dr. Hussein. We actually give a shout out to your study at the very end of our lecture today. So excited to have your thoughts um, as we move into the discussion period. Let's see, Jenny, you think we should get started? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. There are still some folks trickling in, but um, I think we'll just for the in interest of time uh, to give Dr. Webster a, a chance to do his full presentation, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Matt Rivar and along okay. with Jenny Shen, um, we're pleased to um, kick off the yeah. May 8th edition. And it, by the way, if everyone could mute themselves, if they're not uh, speaking, that'd be great. So anyway, we're uh, launching the May 8th edition of the West Coast ISPD uh, sponsored Home Dialysis Journal Club. Uh, and it looks like we've got a, a nice quorum here to get started. So really without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Luke Webster, who is a fellow at UCSD in nephrology. And uh, I think I haven't seen our, our guest come on, but I think we may be expecting a guest who's one of the co-authors from the article he's going to be presenting. So Luke, go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, Dr. Carl and I were very excited to be involved with today's ISPD West Coast Journal Club. Again, big thank you to the ISPD for making this possible and to Dr. Rivara and Shen for their assistance with coordination. And I'd like to big, give a big thank you and welcome uh, to Dr. Wong, uh, who's one of the authors of today's study. Um, so today we're going to be discussing their article titled The Evaluation and Outcomes of a Five-Year Assisted Peritoneal Dialysis Program. And Dr. Carl and I really uh, fell in love with this article when it came out just a few months ago because of a patient case that we had that really kind of highlighted the big need for assisted peritoneal dialysis, um, especially here in the US. And so we were very excited to learn uh, what Dr. Wong and her group did and also see what takeaways we could have and what we could apply to our population here in the United States. 
So I would like to first start off with our patient case. And so our patient was a 79-year-old single male who had a history of squamous cell lung cancer with a lobectomy back in 2016. He also had a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and coronary artery disease, and was a former smoker who needed to start peritoneal dialysis back in April of 2021. In terms of his social history, and we highlight this because of a big change that you'll see in the next slide, but you know he was a single gentleman, never married, pretty much kept to himself, but he did have very supportive family, but they didn't live in the same area of the country as our patient. He had very close friends and neighbors, and he really kind of treated them like his kids, so he had a good support system there. Initially, he was able to do all of his peritoneal dialysis, including his exit site care, cycler setup and treatments. He walked without an assist device. He drove himself. He did all of his ADLs. And he was actually kind of really excited to start getting back into this cycling exercise, which was his big passion before needing to start on dialysis. He never once missed a treatment. He had impeccable compliance and adherence. Unfortunately, all of that changed in January of this year where he suffered an NSTEMI. And over the course of the evaluation in the hospital, he needed an angiography, which showed, you know, diffuse three vessel disease. And both his cardiology team and his nephrology team recommended cabbage. Um, but the patient chose to go with a staged PCI um, after discussing with his sisters. So he had the first stage of the PCI, that hospitalization, and then was discharged kind of with further uh, planned stages um, at future visits. The length of stay during that hospital admission was about six days. And unfortunately, over that six days, he actually declined fairly rapidly. And so leaving this hospital uh, admission, he was actually requiring a walker and was much weaker than he was even before that stay. And he was seen by, you know, OT and physical therapy in the, in the hospital. And they recommended that he go to skilled nursing facility or a SNF. Um, but he was not able to do so because of his peritoneal dialysis status. And this patient was very adamant that he wanted to stay on PD as opposed to transitioning to uh, in-center hemodialysis. He also felt that, you know, with just a few days of maybe some home help, he'd be able to get back on his feet and kind of get back to his basic level of functioning before he got sick. And so he went home and he had some neighbors on speed dial who said that they would step in if needed, but he would call them if it was necessary. And of course, you know, as he underwent multiple angiographies with high contrast exposure, we noticed his urine output drop. He became anuric, and of course, we had to modify his PD prescription because of that. A month later, so he presents in February and he's found to have nausea, vomiting, and just worsening confusion for one week and found to really have challenges doing his peritoneal dialysis. Incidentally, kind of at the admission, he was also having a STEMI, but likely what was happening in hindsight is he was just getting more and more uremic as that month went on because he was having difficulty keeping up with his ADLs, keeping up with his home peritoneal dialysis and he started missing more treatments. And then unfortunately, he also had a STEMI because he had maladaption and malposition of one of his stents. So this led to another three days in the hospital. Again, they recommended he go home, or excuse me, they recommended he go to a rehab facility, but he did not qualify because he was on peritoneal dialysis. And this time he went home with his neighbor saying that they would support him every step of the way and do his PD as necessary. So he was still able to do the connections, but he was so deconditioned that he couldn't lift any of his bags, he couldn't move the cycler, he couldn't set things up or even, you know, really take out the trash. He was also starting to like fall asleep and forget setting up his treatments. And he started to have difficulty actually kind of remembering to call his neighbor to come over and set up his cycler for him. And so because of this continued decline, his sisters and the neighbors started to look at other options, including assisted living facilities or senior living facilities, but every place that he interviewed with, they would not take him because he was on peritoneal dialysis. And of course, you know, this was very particular. And so over the course of these months, the relationship between him and his neighbors became a little bit more strained. He was also very private and he didn't want to bother or burden his neighbors. And so he stopped really calling them um, for their assistance. 
And then finally, you know, he presents, unfortunately, again, in March of this year, he was found at, after a fall, found to be in shock, with again, another in STEMI. And this time he was in the hospital for seven days. And he finally qualified to go to a long term acute care hospitals, specifically for rehab and specifically because our long term care hospitals can accommodate him on peritoneal dialysis. And so I think this really highlights a patient who had multiple setbacks and really could have used uh, some significant help with a, a modality such as assisted peritoneal dialysis. Um, and he had a lot of barriers to his care because of some of the CMS limitations that we have in the United States regarding sending patients to rehab facilities. And so actually fit um, in with Dr. Wong's study um, because we thought he could have done well if we had some respite care for him. So kind of starting at a 30,000 foot view, and as I know is well known to all the members of this group, we have seen it's needing some form of dialysis um, over the past two decades. And here are two graphs from the USRDS annual data report going from the year 2000 to the year 2020. And the top graph is really our incidence. You know, it's gone all the way up to 134,000 patients a year, dropped down to 130.5 thousand patients in 2020. And really this translates to approximately 480,000 patients requiring in-center hemodialysis, 65,000 patients using peritoneal dialysis, and approximately 12,000 patients utilizing home hemodialysis. And when you add all these numbers up, in, at least in 2020, we had 808,000 patients requiring some form of ESRD care. And like all things, you know, this costs money. And the more patients we have, the higher the cost and the higher the burden um, in stage dialysis care is on um, kind of the US healthcare system. And as we expect, you know, this incidence and prevalence is expected to increase over time. And I highlight just one study that used kind of a statistical analysis uh, published in JSON by McCullough back in 2019. And they used a mathematical model based on 2015 data to predict where we're going to be by 2030, which all of a sudden doesn't seem that far in the future here in 2023. But what they found is that they expected somewhere between an 11 and 18% increase in incidence, which would translate into about 970,000 patients to 1.3 million patients requiring dialysis by 2030. And with everything, we have to consider what that cost will do for the healthcare system. You know, so some estimates based on the 2018 um, data where there was approximately 550,000 patients insured by Medicare, that translated somewhere into the order of $37 billion spent on ESRD care alone in the United States on top of an approximate $87 billion for CKD care. And has been discussed, you know, as maybe an impetus or a persuasion to perhaps choose one modality or the other, are the perhaps cost-saving differences between peritoneal dialysis versus in-center modalities. And so I'm going to highlight two studies, and, you know, every study shows a slightly different cost difference. And so this one was uh, published in 2022 by Kaplan in Jason, and it really looked at uh, patients from 2008 and 2017 who were Medicare insured and over the age of 65. And they uh, compared the expenditures from in-center hemodialysis patients about 8,300 versus at 8,300 peritoneal dialysis patients. And what they found is that the yearly cost for in-center was approximately maybe $108,000 per year compared to the relative cost savings of peritoneal dialysis, which costs $96,000 a year. And one thing they did note is that over the study period, despite more patients utilizing peritoneal dialysis over time, they really didn't find a, a significant difference in the costs um, as this uh, study moved forward. They also looked at the cost of IV drug use um, for both types of dialysis, the cost of rehabilitation, and other non-dialysis costs. And they did find that, you know, the in-center hemodialysis costs more among, excuse me, all three of these domains. But it is noted that as more patients utilize peritoneal dialysis, 
the cost difference for IV drug use, you know, think Epigen, Aranes, all of those um, agents that we give um, for both patients really started to narrow over time. However, if you look at, you know, some other studies, and this one was published by uh, Clumget in back in 2020, the cost savings might not be as clear cut as is described in others. And so this one did a cost average over 10 years. And what they found is, is that peritoneal dialysis costs 16,000 less over a decade compared to hemodialysis. And so that's a, an order of $336,000 versus $352,000. So not quite as much as the approximate $12,000 we saw in the previous study. And it is important to note that over time, or in all of these studies, our PD population tends to have significantly few, fewer comorbidities and comor comorbid illnesses, which perhaps is why we see some of these cost savings in uh, these statistical analyses. And however, I think a more important aspect beyond cost is really, is there a quality of life benefit for patients in one modality versus another? And so I really wanted to highlight two studies that specifically look at quality of life on peritoneal dialysis versus in-center hemodialysis. And so this first one uh, was published back in 2019 by a Korean group um, and where they looked at about a thousand patients um, using this health-related quality of life scoring system. And they looked at patients three months, 12 months, and 24 months after they started dialysis. As would be expected, both modalities showed a pretty significant decline in quality of life upon initiation, which I think is no surprise. But they found in their population that the scores for the effects of kidney disease, the burden of kidney disease, and dialysis staff encouragement, as well as a patient outcome sexual function, were all higher in patients on PD compared to those on in-center hemodialysis at one year and two years after initiation. So I think that at least according to this study, there seemed to be some improvement in uh, several domains for our patients. Now, looking at a slightly larger study um, where uh, this group did a systematic review uh, in 2020 published in the Canadian Journal of Kidney Health and Disease, they looked at two randomized control trials and nine observational studies. And unfortunately, the data didn't bear out quite as strongly as we saw in that Korean cohort. So they found no consistent difference in quality of life measures comparing home modalities, and that included home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis versus in-center hemodialysis. However, if you kind of tease apart the data, there is some suggestion that PD may have superior quality of life in the following domains. Things like cognitive status, role limitation due to emotional and physical function, bodily pain, burden of disease, and things like effects of kidney disease on daily life, sexual function, finance, and patient satisfaction were all rated more highly by patients on a home modality. And I think if you look at some of this verbiage, that kind of makes sense. You know, our home, home dialysis patients are able to do their dialysis on their own time, so perhaps they can stay working perhaps benefiting, you know, this self-rated financial um, improvement. They have ownership and control over their dialysis. So we might see higher um, patient satisfaction and a slightly lower burden of disease. And then also they're able to kind of go about their day and they might have better physical function because again, we're doing dialysis daily and we don't see that post in center slump three days a week. And so, Thinking back to our patient case, I was really kind of interested in what actual limitations there are related to going to a rehab uh, facility in the United States. And I found a press release coming from 2018 where CMS really updated and released the requirements in how nurses and how um, skilled nursing facilities are uh, regulated in terms of providing dialysis care to patients. And one highlight of this study really said that if someone is getting in-center or in-rehab uh, facility hemodialysis, there had to be a trained nurse in the room at all times during the treatment. And if someone was getting a home modality like peritoneal dialysis, they had to have a trained RN or licensed practical nurse 
in the facility at all times that the patient was on their PD treatment. So what this would really say is that they would have to significantly upstaff and have specialized nurses in order to have a nurse in the unit or in the, the facility all day, all night long in order for us to send our patients there. And as I quoted here, you know, we already have an issue um, that was uh, nurse turnover in these facilities, 141% in 2018. I can only imagine that number is higher post COVID pandemic. And another thing to highlight is while all of our home dialysis programs have very strict, you know, peritonitis tracking and quality improvement initiatives, those same initiatives would have to be undertaken by our skilled nursing facilities who probably just don't want to take on the risk and take on the management um, to that level of degree. And so unfortunately, our patients do not have a lot of options if they need a rehab facility. Okay, so now I'd like to kind of really do a deep dive into our paper. And so uh, this paper really focused on assisted peritoneal dialysis, and that is defined as peritoneal dialysis utilizing trained nurses, care aides, to really help manage various aspects of peritoneal dialysis within the patient's home. And they really saw this as an option to assist with managing elderly patients who required dialysis. And so back in 2015, um, the British Columbia initiated this pilot project to explore the feasibility of a provincial PD assist program. And this PDA program outsourced trained caregivers to do some very specific tasks for patients who were on peritoneal dialysis. The patient inclusion required use of CCPD, and it also required patients and caregivers to be proficient in uh, many of the responsibilities of their care. And the, the, the article really divides two groups of patients that they looked at. They looked at those who needed respite PDA, and that was uh, temporary assistance somewhere on the order of two weeks up to three months from a caregiver until the patient was able to return to independent peritoneal dialysis. The second group was a long-term group, and those were patients who had an irreversible physical, cognitive, or social barrier to performing independent peritoneal dialysis. And what they did in this study is they actually utilized trained level three caregivers who provided once daily home visits of up to an hour in length, and they could be seen up to seven days a week. And these caregivers were actually hired, trained, and supervised by an external contractor, which was called Nurse Next Door. And so the caregiver responsibilities actually included anything from dismantling and setup of the cycler, blood pressure and weight checks, adding heparin to the dialysate, moving the peritoneal dialysis supplies, and assisting with disposal of garbage, as well as documenting any findings. The patient or the family um, of those enrolled on PDA still were required to do the CCPD connections. They were also required to make the treatment decisions, i.e. green, yellow, red, um, based on their weight. And they were also there to troubleshoot and manage all the external medical comorbidities. The primary outcome for this study was time on peritoneal dialysis. Their goal was to see if using a PDA program would help increase the length that patients were able to stay on PD as their modality of choice. Their secondary analysis was looking at cost, seeing what the overall cost would be to keep patients enrolled in this program. And when they looked at patients as or when they looked at reasons for why patients left PD, they really classified on three different modalities or three different categories. One was dying on PD, and they defined that as death within six weeks of the last PD treatment, transplantation, or transfer to hemodialysis for more than 90 days. So moving on uh, from their methods to their table one. So table one shows uh, four columns. Here on my left side of the screen, uh, we see our, their respite group, which included 32 patients. Their long-term group included 270 patients. Comparator one was a matched CCPD cohort, specifically to the long-term patients. Comparator two was all of the other PD patients in the province. Um, just to kind of give a representation to the rest of uh, the PD patients um, that they had enrolled um, in their outside PD clinics. The red boxes show some slight differences between the groups. So 
you know, the age in the general population was a little bit lower than the average age of 74 in the long term in the match group. All the groups seem to have a pretty broad um, age enrollment, anywhere from, you know, 26 to 91 years old. When we look at things like the rate of diabetes and the rate of cardiovascular disease, in the, the study group, approximately 70% um, had diabetes and approximately 55% had cardiovascular disease. There were slightly lower rates of both of those in the general unmatched cohort. Looking at dialysis vintage in months um, for both the respite and the long term, you know, th the respite group was on dialysis for about 17 months that ranged from 4.5 months to 28 months. And the long term group was on dialysis for about 10 months with an, a range of 2.8 to 28 months. And I think one thing that's really important, important to point out is when you look down here at the incident PD, 18% of the patients in the long-term group started their peritoneal dialysis on this PDA assist program, which I think is uh, a, a big finding and I think really important to kind of consider as we move forward. Transitioning over to their results. So this uh, graph shows the probability of remaining on peritoneal dialysis. So the probability is on this axis. We have time um, on our bottom axis. The colors represent uh, green as our PD assist patients. Uh, pink is our matched CCPD cohort and purple is the general um, everyone else cohort. And what they found is that PDA patients were significantly less likely to terminate PD compared to the matched CCPD cohort. And that had a hazard ratio of 0 0.72, a confidence interval of 0.6 to 0.88, which was statistically significant. And one thing to point out is that perhaps the data or the trends start to separate somewhere around the eight month line. And that's where we see this green line kind of start to, to peel off from our other two lines. And it stays kind of different throughout the rest of the evaluation period. So what about, you know, how long can we keep them on uh, PDA or excuse me, how long can we keep them on PD by utilizing a PDA service? And so this is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the probability of remaining on PDA over months from PDA start. And it really shows that the median months on the PDA service was 13.6, and that ranged from 11 to 16 months. So this suggests that utilizing the long-term PDA program, we were able to prolong a patient's use of PD by like a little bit over a year, which I think is very important. So transitioning to kind of an evaluation of why people stopped or terminated their PD. So out of the 270 patients who utilize long-term PDA, 195 stopped over the study period. About 31% transitioned to hemodialysis, and it was cited that it was likely due to an underlying medical comorbidity that required them to transition. 37.5% utilized long-term PD until death. 16% continued at PD at home or in long-term care, and 3.6% were transplanted. And when you compare some of this data to the comparator CCPD group, only 29.5% in that comparator group utilized PD until death. So this suggests that we were able to keep patients on this modality, PD, at least all the way up until their end of life. And a little bit more granular, um, looking at those who use PDA until death, about 49% of the patients died within six weeks of last PDA, uh, compared to 28.9% of those in the matched comparator CCPD group. And only 7% of those patients transitioned to HD prior to death in the PDA group, compared to approximately 10% in the comparator group. So this suggests that we're not unnecessarily transitioning patients to IHD right before um, their demise, uh, which I think is an important quality of life factor. So thinking about um, how they enrolled over time, and I think this is an exciting graph for how their program and how their service grew from their initiation in 2016. So they, um, in 2016, they had maybe 11 patients on the program, and that grew all the way up to here, where we had 101 patients on their uh, long-term program in 2021. This represented 11.2% of the total population. 
And I think that's it'll be exciting to hear perhaps from Dr. Wong and their group at, after we end kind of how this has continued to develop and grow um, since the publishment of this data. So finally, turning over to their secondary outcome, which is cost. How much did this program cost, as well as how does that cost compare with things like in-center hemodialysis? So starting with the dark navy blue, we have the baseline cost of peritoneal dialysis care in general. And that approximate cost is somewhere about $44,000. Comparing that to in-center hemodialysis, which costs approximately $88,000 Canadian, PD is about $44,000 cheaper at its baseline. Red represents the PDA cost for long-term patients. So over the course of uh, the time that the patients were enrolled in the study, PDA costs about $20,000. Again, even with the baseline PD cost, as well as the PDA cost, there still represents approximately a $20,000 cost savings when compared to in-center hemodialysis, which I think is uh, important viability for continuing this program. Even looking at patients who reside in a long-term care facility, staying on peritoneal dialysis, that still represents perhaps maybe a six to $8,000 cost advantage over in-center hemodialysis. And what I thought was you know, really interesting is that when you look at the patients using respite, so the patients using respite used it for a median of 29 days, that only cost about 1250 Canadian dollars, which seems pretty cost effective for someone who needs just a little bit of help uh, to get them through an acute illness. You know, so I wanted to highlight their excellent visual abstract. And so just in conclusion of their study, overall, they had 322 patients over their study time period of 2016 to 2021. About 90% used long-term PDA and 10.6% used respite. They found that long-term PDA really did prolong the duration of PD by a median of 13.6 months, which I think is really important. Again, you know, there seems to be about a $20,000 cost to using the PDA long-term, but that still represents a cost savings over in-center hemodialysis. And then finally, I think they do highlight that about 37.4% of their PDA patients were able to utilize this service until death. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, slight transition of all this work that we see our colleagues doing up in Canada. And I was curious if there are any efforts here in the United States to kind of evaluate the feasibility and the practicality of implementing this within our a slightly different cost structure and payment system. And so Dr. Hussein and his group uh, released a feasibility study um, that was done up in Northern California in 2022. They had six California PD units that were really utilizing PDA. Their study was using non-registered nurses and they were really providing temporary support for up to 90 days for their patients. Of the 34 patients that they enrolled, about 17 or more than half were new start patients and 15 were prevalent patients on PD. And at the end of the program, 94% discharged on PD without any staff assistance. And I think what they found is that the amount of intervention that they needed was you know, about 17 days was the number uh, average duration on the program and they needed a median number of visits of six. So slightly different from the one hour a day, seven days a week that these patients could utilize um, on Dr. Wong and her team's program. And furthermore, this study used uh, televisits and 12% were done by video and voice calls. And I think it's really exciting that we're starting to see these efforts start to take root because I think, you know, if our patient had had access to some sort of assistance or support program, I think he could have been able to perhaps gone to rehab, gotten the uh, functional uh, uh, PT that he needed, and perhaps could have stayed out of the hospital and done better over time, as opposed to bouncing back on three separate occasions. So I would just like to thank everyone for your attention before we transition into our discussion period. Um, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Carl, for all of her guidance. And again, thank Dr. Wong and her group for joining today. 
And Dr. Wong, I'd actually like to first start the discussion uh, with you. And I'm really curious of your insights your group took away from this uh, pilot project, and also excited to learn perhaps where this uh, study has continued to grow over the past two years since you published this paper. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. That was excellent. Um, and I just want to say hello to everyone. Um, my name is Shannon Wong. I'm a home dialysis fellow from UBC. Um, so I'm just doing an additional specialty training in peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. So um, I thought that this PD assist program was very relevant um, kind of during my training. Um, so I guess to answer your question, the reason that we did this study was really to kind of reflect and see how our PD assist program was doing since its, 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 since its inception in 2016. And I think the main takeaway for me was that it is a really um, great program that's accessible to a lot of patients. Um, it seems to be cost effective. And I think one of the big takeaways for me at least is that it actually prolongs um, patients' ability to be retained on peritoneal dialysis and also allows certain patients to, I guess, you know, reach end of life um, on dialysis. And I know traditionally that's kind of thought of as a, a negative outcome, but for a lot of our patients who are more frail, as you, as you mentioned, there are about 18% instant patients who could start on this program. So I think kind of reframing our idea of who would be eligible for the program and actually making that, you know, more of a positive outcome for patients who are more frail, who might otherwise have to be on hemodialysis. I think that was really big takeaway outcome for me. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the data to show um, the exact numbers of patients on peritoneal dialysis assist um, over the last two years, but I know the program has kind of slowly but steadily grown. Um, and it definitely is something, at least in my experience as a fellow, something that I've seen more um, offered to patients who are kind of proposed the idea of peritoneal dialysis at the outset. So if our nurses that are kind of interviewing our patients already find that you know, their social circumstances or their medical circumstances um, may benefit from this program, it's kind of already suggested at the outset. So I think that's been kind of nice to see in my own personal experience of what um, we're kind of educating our patients about. Awesome, thank you so much. Have, have you found that this has perhaps changed your practice in being more willing to offer dialysis to patients who are kind of on the sicker spectrum um, uh, you know, end up your overall more comorbidities. Cause I know sometimes we say like, oh, they're not able to do it themselves. You're not a candidate for hemodialysis just because mm -hmm. of your overall health. But it seems like this, this really would benefit some patients and give them a few year or several months more, um, duration of life. If they're able to utilize a home modality. Yeah. Um, Forgive me, I, I don't um, know as well in terms of your system um, how you usually triage patients, but at least for us at our center, generally patients who are considered, you know, um, approaching kind of end stage renal failure, generally we'll have a discussion about modalities of renal replacement therapy, whether that be um, identifying them for a conservative pathway versus talking about dialysis therapies. And generally we do try to, um, encourage home-based dialysis therapies first. So that would be peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. Um, but as you said, if patients are generally a bit more frail, um, but they still do have, you know, a lot to live for, or they're still very interested in dialysis, but may not traditionally be, you know, a good candidate for in-center hemodialysis, I think this is a nice um, thing to offer patients. And Again, kind of in my personal experience, I've seen more elderly patients being offered this um, because peritoneal dialysis does exist. So I think it's it's a nice option for patients um, as long as, as you know, they are still able to do certain things for themselves, like do those connections or have a family member to help with that. So obviously there's that caveat. And I think as the program grows, um, grows, as you could see in the paper, one of the things we're hoping for is to maybe expand the um, responsibility and the role of that caregiver to make the program even more accessible to others. And I, I'm looking through the 
chat, Dr. Wong, and it looks oh, like sure. Dr. Hussein asked, um, mm -hmm. do you have any formal evals for frailty, cognition, or any other psychosocial variables that you used mm -hmm. um, or routinely use in your patients? Um, I don't think there is a formal evaluation that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I think that the nurses have a specific checklist for us. Um, I, I don't know if it if it has like a a specific basis or or something like that, but I know that there is kind of a checklist that they go through, and then after that, the the patients will meet with the physicians as well, and then we'll kind of go through those same things to identify if there are any um, barriers. But I know there is kind of a central process that the nurses at least go through with the patients and their families first, and then if they think that the patients are a good candidate, then the physicians will um, kind of do a second check on that. And it looks like we might have some hands from the audience. Oh, uh, Dr. Lau, I think I saw your hand first. Hi, yes. Um, thank you for going through that excellent paper. You know, it was very enlightening to me. And this, my question is related to Dr. Roy Matthews' question um, in the chat. Because mm. these um, trained uh, PD assist personnel were only coming in for an hour. Mm. <laughs> and the PD therapy, you know, realistically is 10 to 12 hours with the setup and the actual treatments. Um, so it's very enlightening to know that even just that one hour of someone coming in pro made such a big impact on the mm -hmm. sustainability of the PD for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as Dr. Matthew was asking, well, what is it um, exactly in the aspect of the care at home really, really made that difference? The, mm -hmm. the hookup, the unhooking, the troubleshooting, or um, was there any uh, feedback via phone during the night if there was an issue that came up with the cycler? Um, so would appreciate your, your providing some details. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately in our paper, we didn't kind of go through that exactly. Like we weren't able to, you know, kind of break that down in more detail. But I think, um, personally what I suspect is just having someone to kind of check in on the patient more frequently is probably what's helping the most because as I mentioned um, at least for our study our caregivers they would document blood pressures or weights um, and I think just having someone to go into the home they would able they would be able to see if you know they were worried about the patients they would always be able to contact our nursing unit to let us know that something was wrong or they would be able to call an ambulance if they were kind of unsure of something so i think maybe having someone kind of check on these patients more frequently might actually be the thing that's helping because as you said you know just lifting a bag you know you wouldn't think you know traditionally that 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 should have such a such a big impact, but I think maybe it's someone who's able to check in on them more frequently. And then, as you said, have that feedback mechanism of telling their nurses that they're worried that something's wrong. Um, and that kind of prompts us to follow up a bit more closely on the medical side. Um, and then just to mention to your um, comment about if they had issues overnight, um, generally the nurse next door, they're not accessible like in an overnight time. So um, the patients, if there's ever any concerns, they can always reach the on-call physicians. So sometimes we have had that where a patient's family member will say, like, I'm having this issue, can you help me? So either they'll call the physician on call or sometimes even reach out to um, Baxter, which is the, the company, and kind of ask for help troubleshooting in the middle of the night. And I know, um, you know, Dr. Hussein and his group in their paper, they did survey the patients. I was pulling it up on my phone. So it seems like 53% needed cycler setup, 43% needed to review and dress the exit site, and then maybe 40% checking weight, 30% um, checking blood pressure mm. were kind of what they, so cycler setups, at least in their cohort, seem to be the highest um, necessary um, assistance. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at that paper after. Thank you. Dr. Gulper, I see a hand. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, good job, Luke. Uh, so to, to all the participants, uh, it seems that what we're talking about is helping people on PD. And so one extreme would actually be having an assistant 
go to the patient, be, be it to the home or even a skilled nursing facility. The other extreme would be, uh, well, doing nothing, but let's put somewhere in between. And that has to do with this remote monitoring. And you had mentioned that Baxter was your predominant system. And uh, most of these patients were getting cycler dialysis. So uh, Baxter has a the share source system. And so what do you think could be the role of uh, remote monitoring in conjunction with this, e either to minimize the extent of the assistance or in any other way. Any any thoughts from any of the participants uh, uh, on remote monitoring and its role in assisted PD? Well, I certainly know that at least through the VA, which I see the most home health telemonitoring, you know, it would be uh, very easy to implement for our VA patients, which I granted are slightly different than the rest of our uh, patients that we see over at UCSD. But I think having access to a scale and a blood pressure cuff that automatically upload into the EMR, um, as well as a nurse that's able to call and check in if any of those values are abnormal, I think that would be a huge uh, benefit uh, to our PD patients. And I think it would be very easy to integrate them into that system. Well, so I'm going to, a lot further with the, the Baxter share source. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> you may not be familiar with that, but but I'm pretty sure that Dr. Wong and their team uh, is. Uh, did, did, did you utilize that in these patients? Um, so in our sites, at least... Um... The ones I work at, Vancouver General Hospital, St. Paul's Hospital, um, we have Baxter Ami, a share source. So it kind of uploads both um, the patients. If they take their blood pressure monitoring, it uploads it to a shared system where their nurse can access it, as well as their weight monitoring, including um, you can even see like how much fluid gets removed during the cycles and things like that. Um, so I think that some of our patients who were... Um, on the PD Assist program, we're using the AMIA share source. And I think it's just an additional, um, I guess, data point for our nurses to be able to kind of check in with the patients to see who might need um, extra help at home. Um, in terms of integrating that with the PD Assist program, I mean, you might say like, if you already have all these data points, do you still need the, um, the caregiver to go in the home? And I think that part of the benefit of that is just having an extra set of eyes on someone if they're kind of, you know, you're worried about them and they might not be able to get to your center to do an in-person assessment. Um, and I think also just helping with those kind of um, other tasks at the home um, that some of our patients need, like, um, you know, dismantling the system, lifting the bags, things like that. But I think our, our um, cycler machines, at least um, in British Columbia, we're moving towards more of the AMIA share source. So it will be um, really helpful to have those extra data points for our patients. Luke, if I may add, add some, something here. Well, f first, can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Very, very nice presentation. And, and the way that you put it is, is really fantastic because you started with the patient story. Just telling about yeah the real need of of this service in in our practices, and thank you, Dr. Wang, uh, for joining today and and shedding more light on on the study. I just wanted to add something about our experience about this remote um, uh, visits, because uh, and maybe I'll just put it in the context of how we provided the service here in in California. Our program now has about seventy patients um, has has helped around seventy patients, and we're growing so. We're babies compared to the Canadian experience, but but it is the only wide scale service that's available in the U.S. and it's uh, provided as a as a study. And don't forget that we there is no payment for it in here, and there are compliance issues. And for us to be able to provide it as a study, we were not able to provide it for long term uh, support because these patients need something after you you stop the study. So our program is limited to short term, meaning that they need it for a maximum of three months. And of course, if if a patient needs it more, we can we can actually 
revisit that. Um, uh, so far, I only needed it for one or two patients, and we didn't need it uh, for much longer. The, the way that we looked at the service is um, uh, provide it just as much as, as the patient needs it and, and take it away or, or try to wean it down and get the patient and the family to become independent of the staff as soon as possible. We provided it with uh, CCHDs, um, uh, PCTs, if you like, um, not non-nursing staff. And that's to show that it can be done with limited cost because not only the cost, you have a, a scarcity of, of nursing uh, support as well. So you cannot actually take the nurses from the centers to go and do, do this extra service. Um, uh, and, and the way we work on it is, if the if you don't need to be physically at the patient's home, why do you why do you, should you go there? Remember that the indications are not always physical. Sometimes it's cognition and psychosocial. And it's a lot of the time that we we what we found is that patients just need this extra person on on their shoulder. Yes, they were able to do PD well at the center with the nurse looking at them, but they don't have that confidence when they go home that they will be able to do it as well. So we would go there and we would support, but the moment that the patient actually can function with just well, with just a video support, we transition to that, and that's how we incorporated uh, video 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 visits. The 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 remote monitoring that's available with the machines. This is available anyway for any patient, and, and the nurses look at them and. And they would be able to identify if there are any issues with the patient's weight or blood pressure or how they're doing dialysis or they're skipping the um, adherence issues. This is available for everybody and uh, and would be really dependent on on the on the center on how they're using their their assistance. Dr. Hussein, how were you um, supporting the this program? Because as you mentioned, it's not reimbursable. Yeah. So it's uh, it's by an internal fund from from satellite healthcare. Um, uh, so it's uh, for for a study for a clinical study, and we've expanded now to fifteen centers. And uh, initially, when we did it as a pilot, it was done by coordinators. It's it's actually fascinating how the law actually makes it harder. Um, uh, as clinicians, we can judge if an, a nurse needs to be there or not. And the reality of PD is that you train the patient to do it. You train the family to do it. So why, when you need to send a healthcare professional, do you demand a, a nurse um, um, when it can be done with a, with a PCT? And it, it actually opened the door for a lot of PCTs as well to advance their careers and, and venture into a new, a new modality of care. They love it um, and, and advance their careers and, and, and get more reimbursement as well. So we've expanded now instead of it being done by coordinators from this from uh, uh, from the research team, we train CC, uh, PCTs uh, uh, in in the centers in the home dialysis centers to do this service, and the training is short, like uh, Dr. Wang's paper. The the training um, that we designed was a five hour training on on PD and then shadowing at the center and then um, uh, just training on the. Uh, on the study uh, components of this. And, and I might, might answer one of your earlier questions. It only takes an hour. So, and this is our, has been our experience. It, it only takes an hour of their time in addition to the travel back and forth. But because it's because it, it just gets them on the dialysis, usually there is no problem after they've started dialysis. And usually you would be able to set up uh, somebody to be able to di um, uh, disconnect them and, and take the, 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 the garbage out. And, uh, and, and you can organize it in a very good way to minimize the cost. So one of the other things that we've, we've been working on is weekend, particularly Sundays. Um, uh, so the question always becomes, does the patient really need to do seven days a week? Um, uh, that's one. The second thing is, and uh, we have, we've seen resistance actually more from the physicians, um, uh, which is strange because when you look at the remote remote monitoring, you see that a lot of patients are not doing seven days a week as prescribed. So, uh, but anyway, that's a, another discussion. Um, uh, so the next question we ask, okay, can you, uh, 
here, here's the interesting thing. Sometimes the family and friends, uh, they're not available during the week, but they're available to help during the weekend. So, okay, why not utilize that? Um, the third thing is if you can uh, uh, transition to virtual visit. The fourth thing is, can you prepare things in a way um, uh, that will take away the need for you to go in person on the Sunday? Some of these patients, um, all they need is somebody to take the supplies from their main storage to the treatment area. Um, uh, and they can handle it afterwards. You can actually put in um, uh, equipment to help them. You can actually talk to somebody to help with that. Three is uh, individualization of, of the need and, and you can work, work around on, on these things. Dr. Hussein, I think you bring up a great point of trying to identify what needs to be done by nursing staff and what can be done by non-nursing um, aides. And Dr. Wong, uh, a question in the chat for you is, did your nurses need a home health certificate or license to go to a patient's home? Um, that's one of the barriers that one of our participants has um, in California of just, you know, there's a lot of licensure barriers um, to kind of get these skilled uh, uh, individuals into a home. Yeah, so um, our our caregivers that go into a home are not nurses. They're not nursing trained. They just have to go through this nurse next door program in order to be licensed. Um, to be honest, I don't think the barrier is in getting the licensure, but rather in getting people who are interested to um, kind of work in this field. Um, so I think that that is not really a barrier. It's more kind of getting your foot in the door and having people interested. And I think jumping off that point is, you know, at least here in California, a lot of our Medi-Cal patients have access to IHSS or that's in-home services where they can appoint a caregiver. And those caregivers are not necessarily medically trained, certainly not necessarily nursing trained. And so Dr. Carl and I were kind of wondering, is there some way that we could leverage somehow training these IHSS caregivers to kind of provide some of the similar services that uh, your caregivers or your, your trained um, staff uh, provided from the Nurse Next Door program. And granted, it's very limited because uh, it's all driven by Medi-Cal is our understanding. And please, anybody from the group jump in. Um, I have limited understanding <laughs> on the ins and outs of IHSS qualification, but we certainly thought that that might be an opportunity to leverage if we could provide additional training for, you know, uh, similar to what Nurse Next Door does. Uh, I, I think that's very interesting, and I'm glad to see CJ is actually on the call there. But but may I may I take you back to the to the slide where it shows a comparison of the cost? Let let me just point something out, which is very important yep. uh, for I'll us go back. for the American sure. healthcare community. Do you want this slide? This one, yeah, exactly. As painful as it is, we need to we we need to talk about this because this is the elephant in the room. That cost differential does exist, and and I do know if you if you perform the calculations in different ways, include hospitalizations. That's another thing that that you'd like to do. But but I think the uh, the, the paper mentions that, for example, transport is included in the in-center hemodialysis cost. But uh, here's the thing. Who's paying? And how does it, what, what's the difference from a per, the perspective of the physician, from the dialysis provider, and from the payer? And even though there is a cost differential here, um, uh, the, the, the one who, if, if you look at it from the perspective of these different um, uh, parties, you would see that some of them have no financial incentive to do anything. Particularly that you know that the that the dialysis provision is actually spread very thin now with the staffing issues and the increase in in, in healthcare costs and and supplies. From a dialysis provider perspective, I can tell you that the patient because if the patient doesn't remain on PD, where does he go? To the in-center hemodialysis unit, and if that's the same provider, you 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 get the point. Um, uh, and if, if there is a saving for, for the payer, the payer needs to actually step in in here. And I think the, the great opportunity that we have now is with the new value-based care systems, 
and and we need to be able to talk to the to the payers as well and and see how how they can step in. Um, uh, I, the reason I mentioned CJ is um, uh, Kaiser. I think they have a, a smaller program that they've been running for a while, and and they're they're actually they, within Kaiser Permanente. They have um, uh, I, I I think. Uh, I saw that at one of CJ's uh, NKF presentations um, uh, that they talked about the Kaiser Hel Home Health um, uh, uh, program. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to talk on behalf of CJ if, if you want to jump in, CJ. Um, uh, CJ, go ahead. Yeah, it's not uh, in my uh, hospital. My patients are go through Hussein. Dr. Hussein's uh, satellite unit. It's my partner, Dr. Neelan Baha Bala at uh, San Leandro, California area. So we are, since we are integrated healthcare systems, so we we are prepaid. So there's, we get the payment out of the picture and our goal is keep our patient at home. And fortunately in her uh, unit, there's one nurse who has also a home health certificate. It's an NRPD nurse, so she was able to go to patient's home, provide assistance, uh, similar to what everybody is doing. It's, you know, helping set up the machine, uh, help uh, putting the bag in the machine. And one time she went to a patient's home, patient had a nervous breakdown for a psychiatric issue, and she was able to call 911 for the patient. Uh, so we are still trying to expand this, uh, again, with limited funding, try to do this. Uh, it's, it's very uh, helpful to our patient. We really need to expand this. Thanks so much for sharing. So it's 1.30. Um, if any of you um, want to stay on for a couple more minutes, um, that's fine. But thank you so much. This is amazing, Luke. This is an amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, um, Dr. Hussein, uh, Dr. Zeng, for sharing all of your um all of your uh, insights for all these all these amazing programs. This was the last uh, West Coast Journal Club for the academic year. We're going to come back in September, and I'll send you guys some emails to remind you. Um, but thanks. This has been amazing, and I'm so glad that we were able to really uh, help out the fellows, and having all the faculty involved has been really, um, really invaluable as well. So have a great summer. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Yeah, thank you so much. Great presentation, Luke. Thank you. Great job, Luke. Think we're good. Okay, thanks, good Dr. Carl.